Well, good evening. Uh, welcome back to Nathan's study through the book of Matthew. Uh, you've probably gathered that I'm not Nathan. Uh, he's out of town uh, uh, taking care of uh, family matters uh, with the death of his sister. Uh, and so let's just start with a prayer for him uh, and his family. Father, just pray that you'd bless uh, Nathan, uh, bless his sister, uh, and the, the rest of their family who are mourning the loss of his other sister. I pray, God, that you comfort them. Give them wisdom as to how to comfort and encourage each other. And just bless them with a good memorial, uh, with good memories. Thank you for life and opportunity while we're here. Help us to use it in every way for you. And we pray it through Jesus' name. So we'll be continuing uh, Nathan's study in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter uh, 16, uh, and really up to this point, uh, we've, we've seen Jesus throughout his ministry. We're uh, somewhere about three years into his ministry, really coming close to uh, the, the end of his ministry. If his whole ministry is about three and a half years, uh, we're, we're far, pretty far along. Uh, and up to this point, we've just come off of chapter 15, where Jesus uh, has uh, healed, or not healed, but has fed the, the 4,000. He's by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and he has gotten in a boat at the end of chapter 15 and has sailed on to the region of Magadan. And the disciples seem to have, have stayed behind and, and they're going to catch up and we'll see him catch up in chapter 16 in our study. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at total. Uh, so let's read. Uh, we're just going to take it in chunks. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Uh, and see uh, what's going on here. So, verse 1. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up, testing him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. But he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you will say, It is fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it, except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So as Jesus enters this region of Magadan, he gets encountered with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they uh, track him down in the hopes to test him. This is a pretty common scene for Jesus. Uh, always being tested. They're trying to uh, discredit him as a Jewish influence, as a rabbi, as a teacher. Uh, but quite the contrary, Jesus always has uh, a really, I mean, productive in some ways interaction with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, in that showing his wisdom is far above any of man's wisdom and his wisdom is directly from God, obviously. Uh, so in this section, the Pharisees come and the Sadducees come and they're testing him. They're wanting to see a sign uh, from heaven. Uh, so uh, they doubted that Jesus could perform a sign from heaven. And that's important because heaven is where uh, God dwells. And so for them to ask for a sign from heaven in the Jewish mind, only God could produce signs in heaven. Anything on the earth was, was subject uh, to question because uh, possibly it could be, uh, I don't know, uh, at the hands of Satan uh, or a demon. Uh, but anything in heaven in the Jewish mind had to be from the hand of God. And so they specifically asked, show us a sign from heaven. And, and this isn't like the first opportunity that the Jews could see a sign or the Pharisees and the Sadducees could see a sign. Really, in, in Matthew, so far, we've seen 14 different miracles that Jesus has performed. Uh, some fantastic miracles about calming seas and walking on water and, and raising people from the dead, uh, healing large groups of people, uh, healing uh, and, and feeding large groups of people, and, and just on and on this list goes on. 14 different times we've seen uh, amazing miracles in the book of Matthew. Miracles that go far beyond just uh, natural occurrences of healing or you know people getting better. Uh, miraculous, outside of the laws of nature. Uh, outside of that, outside of those four individual instances, we've seen seven times in the book of Matthew so far where Jesus has healed entire multitudes and gatherings. And, and I don't, I don't have, have any idea how that could take place, that a whole multitude would be together and people are bringing their sick and lame. And it's, it's got to be just this really depressing scene of people who are hurting. And Jesus somehow heals all of them. I don't know if he goes through and individually heals them or he heals them as a mass. 
Uh, but that had to be a sight to see. And we've seen that seven times so far in the book of Matthew. Uh, and we'll see it. Uh, we'll see it yet again. So here we have multiple occasions of signs being rendered for the scribes and the Pharisees. And yet they come to Jesus late in his ministry and say, okay, show us a sign from heaven. Show us a sign from heaven. And so Jesus, he doesn't just show them a sign. Uh, he never does. Uh, he, never, he never just panders to their requests. Instead, he he talks to them from kind of a, a physical, logical standpoint, which is kind of unique for Jesus. He usually uh, will, will take something uh, out of uh, like, like nature and and show them. And, and so here he's drawing on their own logic, though, and, and their own kind of you know laws that they've produced. And so he talks about the weather. And he says, you can look out at the sky and you can see, you know, if the sky is red and, and it, you know, it means that there's going to be a storm or if the sky is red in, in a different time of day, that it's going to be fair weather. Uh, may, maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, uh, what is a red sky at night, sailors delight, uh, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. All right. This is kind of, I mean, this goes, goes way back, back to the time of Jesus, uh, probably far beyond that. And the idea is that uh, if there's a red sky at night, it has the idea that, the, that there's a lot of dust particles in the air, and as the sun comes down, it's it's shooting through <laughs> the darkness. <laughs> Why do I have a feeling that that's going to be a problem? Uh, so the sun is coming through the atmosphere in, in kind of a longer section of the atmosphere because it's low on the horizon, and all that dust uh, makes the sky look red. Uh, and so if it's in the evening, it shows that, that that storm has already passed on and has moved on. Whereas if it's in the morning, that, that storm uh, is coming in. And so Jesus says, you can look at the, the weather and you can determine whether uh, things uh, are going to be positive or negative. Just by looking at the sky, you can make these assertions. And so Jesus says, can't you tell that I'm the son of man? Can't you tell that I'm the Messiah? Just look at the evidence. Look at the signs. It should, it should show you quite clearly who I am. Uh, and Jesus said, just use your logic. Just use your brain. Just think about it for just a minute. How can you explain all of this stuff that's been going on? Uh, and, and I think that's one of the, the great uh, uh, arguments for Christianity, for creation in general. It's just look at the world around us. And, and you can see uh, people scratching and clawing to try and find explanations for everything. And yet God has these perfect explanations for how everything exists. And just look around. Doesn't your own logic and reason show you that God is the creator and sustainer of all things? And so Jesus says, I'm not going to show you a sign. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pander you to your request. Uh, they've done it this very similar in chapter 14. Uh, they're going to do it again here in chapter 15. And Jesus, or not in chapter 14, in chapter 12, and now he does, they do it to him again in chapter 15, and Jesus has the same answer. Look to Jonah. And that was probably a strange answer for them to hear. Why would we look to Jonah as a sign that you're the Messiah? And the, the reference to Jonah has nothing to do with what Jesus has done, but to what Jesus will do regarding the three days in the tomb. Uh, and so this uh, this prophecy, if you will, about connecting Jonah to Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection was not really much help to the Pharisees and Sadducees at the moment, but something that they would hopefully recognize uh, in the future. Uh, and so Jesus, he's kind of hard on them. He condemns them. In verse 4, he says it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. So I just want to postulate uh, for you, if you think about for a second, what's the difference between uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees here, and them seeking after a sign, and Thomas, at the end of John's gospel, when he says, I won't believe unless I see the holes in his hands and in his side. Like, I need to see those wounds before I'm going to believe. And why is it that Jesus would come to Thomas, and he would say, or you know, he would show him his hand, and he would show him his side, and he would give him that evidence. Yet when the Pharisees and the Sadducees come, they say, show us a sign. Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. What's the difference between the scribes and the Pharisees and Thomas? 
And I think it all boils down to their heart. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees have this heart to test Jesus. Uh, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to discredit him and, and remove him from the public eye. Uh, and, and in this instance, they can say, look, Jesus can't do anything amazing. Jesus isn't the Messiah. He's not from God. He's not, obviously not even a prophet. They're trying to discredit him. Whereas Thomas over here, and he's a genuine truth seeker. And, and maybe he just, he just needs to get past the hurdle. But Jesus knows at the end of showing him his hands and his sides that Thomas is going to reply, my Lord and my God. And this is the difference between Jesus showing these guys signs. And, and I think that that's important. I, I lay all that out because if you're like me and maybe some point in your life or some point future in your life, uh, you kind of ask God for signs. And maybe it's through prayer and, and maybe it's like, God, I, I want to believe you, uh, but sometimes I just question. And so we ask him for things in prayer and we ask for his evidence to be known in our lives. And and I don't know that he's turning to us and saying an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Maybe if our heart is pure, maybe we're like Thomas. And God says, let me just bolster your faith a little bit. Because Sometimes I think we're there. I don't know, maybe you wake up with full confidence in, in God's existence and power in your life every morning. Uh, but I don't. And I think most people don't. And sometimes we break down and, and we, we plead for God, like help us in our unbelief. And God's attitude towards us is quite different than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I think it's ultimately, am I testing God or am I searching for God? Do you seek for signs and why is the question. Verse five, the disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss among themselves, saying, it's because we took no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000? and how many baskets you took up or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he was not saying beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the disciples come to the other side. Jesus has already come to the other side. Remember, at the end of chapter 15, uh, Jesus left and the disciples stayed uh, near the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus sails off to this region of Magadan and uh, has this encounter with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now the disciples have caught up. And so they have this interaction with Jesus. And his remember, he has just gotten off the heels of this, this debate, if you will with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So this is fresh on Jesus' mind. The disciples, they don't know anything about this. They've just come to the party here, and Jesus has kind of a heavy heart about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are drawing the people away and leading them astray. And so he says to them, uh, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Be careful. Watch out for the leaven. Now, the disciples instantly become afraid because they're thinking, man, he, he knows we didn't bring any bread, and he's upset. And Jesus obviously is not talking anything about bread. And so he says, you men of little faith. And so what we see is Jesus declares their little faith because I think, A, because they were thinking physical when God wanted them to think spiritual. And I look at Look at your day. Look at your encounter with God's word and how often are we thinking physical? And maybe God is pleading with us, think spiritual. Right? We focus so much on the physical parts of life and I think we get distracted from the real blessings of the spiritual parts of life. And we get focused on, on work and family and jobs and life and, and, and budgets and all these things that are real and have to be taken care of. And we miss the spiritual parts 
those same people at work that, that need Jesus, who are crying out in hurt, that we don't even see because we're so busy focused on, on the physical. And here Jesus is trying to use a, a really profound illustration, and yet all they can think about is, uh, it must be about bread. Jesus must be upset because we didn't bring any bread. And yet he's trying to teach them something really deep. Men of little faith concern themselves with bread. Men of great faith concern themselves with deep spiritual truths, which is what Jesus is trying to communicate with them. Uh, so first off, uh, men of little faith uh, focus on the physical. Uh, but secondly, men of little faith forget what God has done. Right? So Jesus' next argument is going to be, don't you remember? Can't you just remember? You know, just go back one chapter, right? Just look back. Don't you remember on the other side of the sea when we had all those people sit down and I fed 4,000 people out of just a little lunch? Don't you remember that? When, when all the people sat on the hillside and we fed 5,000 from just a, a meager amount of food? And don't you remember how much food we took up and how none of that makes sense logically and physically? Can't you remember the great miracles that you've seen? Like why would you be con why could you possibly think that Jesus is concerned about bread? Can't you remember the things that God has done? Wow, what, what a tremendous lesson. You know, as you go through the Old Testament, there's a, a, a constant theme of the way God describes himself. And I think it's and I, maybe, I can't say this for sure, but uh, it seems in my mind that it's right, uh, that more than any other way, God describes himself as the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, next time you're reading through your Old Testament, maybe just start making a, a list of the times that you run across that phrase, that the way that God describes himself as the God who brought you up out of slavery, the God who brought you up out of Egypt, the God who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians. All right, those types of phrases where God declares himself as the God who performed this amazing miracle through the 10 plagues, through the crossing of the Red Sea, delivering them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and God freed them as a people. It was an amazing miracle. It wasn't the only miracle that God had done, but he constantly calls himself that to remind them that he is powerful and that he has demonstrated that power in his people's lives. And don't think that he won't do it again. And so here the disciples are stuck thinking like, man, maybe, maybe Jesus is upset about not having food. And Jesus can't help but think, have you forgotten all the amazing things that God has done? And man, I don't know, the, the application is just writes itself, right? Like how often do we think, man, this, this trouble in my life is insurmountable. And God is crying out, have you forgotten how far I have brought you. Have you forgotten how much I've accomplished in your life? How quickly we forget, just like the disciples, how quickly we forget God's miracles. The real point that Jesus is trying to get across is to beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And that's nothing to do with bread. It has everything to do with their teachings because their teachings were leading people astray from your devotion to God's law. And so Jesus warns the disciples, be careful of these false teachers because their teachings are like leaven, leaven that, that penetrates dough and, and spreads throughout it and, and causes reactions within it. And, some, and oftentimes <clears throat> false teachers or false teachings are described as leaven in the New Testament. And it's not a good thing. And so Jesus says, be careful, watch out around you. Look at the teachers around you and make sure that the things that they're teaching are leading us towards God, that are, that are true to God's word, true to his law. And what a, what a great warning for us even today. Like, beware of the leaven of false teachers. There's a, a wide abundance of teachers uh, out there. Just, just turn on your radio go down towards you know, the lower end of your radio in the 80s and the 90s, and there's gonna be teachers of all kinds uh, on the radio talking about all kinds of stuff. And, and sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. And you need to be aware of the leaven of false teachers and compare what you hear with God's word. 
you remember in Acts chapter 17 when, when Paul comes to Berea and he'd just come from Thessalonica and the people of Thessalonica had run him off. Uh, but the people of Berea, as Paul was preaching to him, uh, were uh, uh, questioning Paul and searching the scriptures daily to make sure the things that Paul said were true. And Paul says that they were noble minded, or if you have, I think the NIV says of noble character, because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul said, the apostle Paul, if the things that Paul said were true, they questioned and searched the scriptures. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous attitude. And Jesus is trying to, to instill this in the apostles' minds. Like, you need to be careful who you listen to. Don't listen to any old teacher or preacher that is just spouting off an opinion. You make sure that what you're being taught is accurate according to God's teachings. Because it's like leaven. It will spread all around. And so are we good critics of what's true and what's not? And the only way that we can really get a hold of that is by reading God's word and letting his law uh, in our minds. All right, so the disciples have caught up. They've had this interaction with Jesus about the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, and so we, we pick up in verse 13. <clears throat> now, when Jesus had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So now they've, they've moved together into the region of Caesarea Philippi, uh, and this is, this is different than the city of Caesarea. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is, uh, is named after uh, Philip, uh, who is one of uh, Herod's sons, and when they divided up uh, the area. Uh, so this is not the, the Caesarea that you would normally think of. Uh, but in this, uh, they, uh, this is... This is about six months before Jesus' crucifixion. Obviously, the dating is, is sketchy, uh, but we're somewhere around there. Uh, as you move from chapter 16 into 17 into 18, like our road from this point on is going to be Jesus heading into Jerusalem uh, and, and really not coming out. Uh, he's going to uh, encounter uh, the, the, the Passover meal uh, and the garden and his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion are all right on the horizon. And so that, that's really going to help us as we read chapter uh, 16, uh, this section especially, if you kind of think that Jesus has some of these things on his mind. Uh, and so he's starting to focus a little bit heavier on his sufferings. And so he asks, who are people saying? Who are people saying that I am? And, and look at the reactions. Like some say John the Baptist. Right? And that's some, some common thinking. This is what Herod thought back in chapter 14. And Herod gets kind of, kind of worried because uh, he hears about this guy doing miracles and thinks it's, it's John the Baptist raised from the dead because Herod had put John the Baptist to death. Uh, but that's what some people were saying. Uh, some people were saying Elijah uh, because Elijah, at the end of Malachi, the, the last section of Malachi, chapter 4, is a prophecy that Elijah would come. And so maybe Jesus is Elijah. Uh, well, truth be told, John the Baptist was actually the fulfillment of that, and he was the Elijah that would come. But some people are still talking about that. Some people are still saying, well, this is that Jesus is Elijah. Or some people were saying he's Jeremiah uh, because they were looking for the prophet, uh, and they linked that to maybe a reincarnation of some sort of Jeremiah, uh, a reappearing of Jeremiah. Uh, the point is, the people thought a lot of things, and they didn't really know who Jesus was. They know that he's a powerful prophet. They seem to know pretty clearly that he's from God, but they don't really know who he is. And so he turns to his disciples, and he asks them, aside from what everybody else is saying, 
What is your perception? What is your relationship with God? How do you view God and his son? All right. And wow, like how pointed, like, like is Jesus, if Jesus was asking us that question, like, like who cares what the newspapers say? Who cares what's on the internet? Who cares what you're hearing from the pulpit? What do you say? What is your understanding of Jesus and his power in your life? All right, so he turns to Simon, uh, or, or Simon Peter answers the question uh, in, in one of the most bold ways. All right, and he says in verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I, I apologize for the lights thing. Uh, I didn't realize that these lights were on a timer. Uh, I guess if, probably if I was more animated, I think it's on a, uh, a motion sensor. I could start doing some jumping jacks and stuff for you. Uh, maybe that would lighten things up. Uh, but anyway, sorry, this is this is a really intense section, and I just I just kind of went off track here. All right, verse 16. Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God. What an amazing confession for, for Peter to realize that. Now, Peter has a unique scenario, right? Peter has been with Jesus this whole time. He's seen all these miracles, he's witnessed them. Peter has has seen them in a way that even the other disciples haven't seen them because Peter, James, and John kind of had this close-knit relationship with Jesus. And there were several occasions that Jesus took Peter, James, and John uh, aside, even from the rest of the apostles, and did things with them. We'll see in the next chapter, in 17, when they go up to the Mount of Transfiguration, who does Jesus take? Peter, James, and John. Right? When Jesus is going to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, who goes into the house with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. Right? Like These are the guys that are, are close to Jesus. And so Peter, of all the disciples, of all the apostles, uh, maybe would know this even better. And so he declares that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says in verse 17 that he didn't get this from the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't get this from Jewish leaders. He got this because God revealed it to him. And then Jesus talks about building something. Right? Because now that Peter understands who Jesus is and he's ready to declare him as the Christ, Jesus is ready to build his church. And this is not a, a common word that we see in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't talk about his church very much. We see it a lot in the epistles, obviously, because the church has already been established and Paul is, is you know, preaching and establishing churches and writing letters to churches and encouraging churches. But in the Gospels, we don't see it very often. But here Jesus is talking about it and what it's going to be built on. And so the church that Jesus has built, and, I, and don't think of when you, we talk about the church, don't think of like the Mount Comfort to Church of Christ. Uh, like this is just a piece of the universal church. Like right? Jesus is building a worldwide movement. And what is it going to be based on? Well, there's some disagreement as to what it's based on. Uh, and, and Jesus is making a play on words here. So in verse 18, he says that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, there's, there's a play of words going here because the word for Peter is the word Petros, which means a very small rock, right? Which also is his name, right? This is the name that Jesus gives him. If you remember, his, his, uh, his uh, Jewish name is Simon, right? But Jesus gives him this name, Peter. And so... It's a, this small rock that you would have. And that's Peter's role in the kingdom. He's a, he's a small rock. And then Jesus says, but upon this rock, and he switches to a different word, a feminine word, Petra, which is a much larger, a huge stone, even a foundation, uh, a bedrock, you might say. And so there's this play on word that, that Peter, you're a rock, but you're just a small part in this whole thing. But there's something enormous that I'm going to build my church on. And so if it's not Peter, because he's just a small rock, the only thing that we're left with, and the only thing that really makes sense in the whole context here, is what Peter declared about Jesus. The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the very foundation of the church. And ne'er should we ever build the church on anything else, because that's what Jesus built it on. And so when we talk to people about the gospel, when we... When we preach, when we teach, when, well, when we just share our faith, shouldn't it be about Jesus and the declaration that he's the son of God? 
If we try and convert people uh, with really any other thing, what are we converting them to? Well, we're not converting them to Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, no foundation can be laid except that which has already been laid, which is Christ Jesus. It's the only foundation. It's what everything is built upon. Some have, have run with this and said that Peter is what the church was built upon, and, and then that becomes like this string of leadership that goes throughout the ages, uh, just, you know, going all the way back to Peter. But Jesus is not building the church on Peter. He's building the church on the fact that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so he will build his church, future tense, will build. Uh, now, all of this goes on, and then at the end of the section there, uh, you'll notice kind of an interesting thought. Verse 20, he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Why would Jesus spend all this tr time trying to ascertain that the, the disciples understand that he's the Christ, and then he says, okay, I don't want you to tell anybody. I want you to keep this, keep this silent among us. Uh, this is often referred to as the messianic secret. Uh, this is that Jesus didn't want everybody uh, talking about him being the Messiah. Maybe because it was going to attract too much attention. Uh, maybe it's going to uh, attract too much opposition from the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, but this is uh, the, the fourth time in the Gospel of Matthew that we've seen Jesus say to people, don't tell other people. Uh, back in chapter 8, he did it with the leper, you know, and he cleansed the leper. He's, he said, don't tell people about this. In chapter 9, when he healed the two blind men, same thing. He said, don't tell people about this. Uh, in chapter 15, when he healed the multitude, he said the same thing. And, and here we have it in chapter 15, I'm sorry, in chapter 16, with people, uh, the disciples specifically, knowing that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We'll see it later uh, in chapter 17, after the transfiguration. Uh, so Jesus is kind of trying to keep things under control about the spread. Now, it often happened, like with the leper and the blind men, they went and they told people anyway. Like, how, how can you not? Like, I can now, I was blind and now I can see. How can you not tell people about Jesus? And so even though he told people not to say it, oftentimes they did. Uh, but Jesus, I think, is trying to limit his exposure at this point uh, because he's right on the edge of going into Jerusalem. He's on the edge of being crucified. And he still needs time. There's still things that he needs to do. He still needs to have the transfiguration. Uh, and he still needs to have the Passover meal. And he still needs to be in the garden. All these things still need to take place. The time is not, the timeline is fulfilling itself. There, there's another point in here that I, I, I skipped over that we should probably talk about. Uh, that Peter was given the power in verse 19 to bind and to loose. Right? You see that in verse 19? Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This was not given to Peter specifically. Right? If you jump to chapter 18, uh, in verse 18, so chapter 18, verse 18, he's going to tell this to all the disciples. He's going to say the same thing. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So all the apostles were given this same teaching, not just Peter. And I think it has the idea that, uh, that Jesus is the foundation and the apostles and the prophets are part of that. And Jesus is the cornerstone, I guess, if we switch our illustration. The apostles and the prophets are the foundation, Jesus himself being the cornerstone uh, from Ephesians. Uh, and so they're given authority to bind and to loose. They're given the authority to create covenant, to, to bring God's will, to establish God's will in men. And that's what we're going to see with kind of the rest of the New Testament, the apostles preaching and teaching and writing letters. Uh, and that uh, inspiration uh, is being recorded. And it's going to be binding. Right? That's going to be binding as far as God's covenant for his people. And Peter's going to be a part of that. But it's not Peter alone. Like Peter's part of the rest of the apostles who are doing that as well. All right, 21 down through the end of the chapter. Let's, let's finish off here. From that time, Christ began showing his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem 
and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his glory of the Father with his angels and will recompense every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, so now that Peter and the apostles have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, Peter has declared that he's the Christ. Uh, they kind of established that uh, we're, we're not going to tell anybody uh, about that. And so notice in verse 21, from that time, all right, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. All right, so this starts a pattern where Jesus is going to start talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection in the book of Matthew. Uh, three times he's going to specifically tell them. We have right here, uh, right after the confession of of Peter. We're going to see it again in chapter 17, right after the transfiguration. Jesus is going to talk about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Uh, and then in, in chapter 20, right before Jesus goes into Jerusalem, he's again going to tell them about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And, and this whole concept of, of a suffering Messiah didn't really work with the apostles. It didn't work really with any of the Jews. They had this image that the Messiah was going to be kind of a military warlord who would come in and reestablish the throne of David. He would, he would oust the Romans and reestablish uh, Israel as its own nation, with its own borders, with its own law, a, a free nation. And so, especially at this time, if you're thinking, like, man, we're oppressed by the Romans, we're under their rule, we have been, uh, really, it seems like, you know, with the Greeks and the Persians and the Babylonians, like this has gone on and on. And finally, the Messiah is going to come, put an end to all of this. It's going to be like the glory days of David. Right? That's their idea, this physical Messiah that's going to establish a kingdom. And Jesus is absolutely going to establish a kingdom. But it's not the kingdom that they're waiting for. It's not the kingdom that they have in mind. And part of this whole process is about Jesus being arrested, being killed, and raised on the third day. And that just doesn't compute with the apostles. How is it that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, that you're going to build your church, great things are on the horizon, yet you're going to be executed? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense at all. You're supposed to reign. You're supposed to be our king. You're going to sit on the throne, and, and this kingdom is going to be reestablished underneath your power. And Jesus says, in order for any of that to take place, I'm going to have to be killed. He also tells them that he's going to be raised on the third day. And I, I don't know. Maybe they didn't understand that. Maybe that doesn't click with them. If, if you were to go back 2,000 years before the resurrection. I mean, you've been hearing about the resurrection your whole life. If that wasn't really logical or reasonable to you, maybe they just maybe they just skipped over that part. They didn't hear that part or it didn't make sense. Uh, that, that, that would be reasonable. Uh, but Jesus is foretelling his death here. And I think he could do this because of the interaction that they've just had uh, with in verse 16 with Jesus with Peter declaring that Jesus is the Christ he's ready to start talking about harder serious things about the future and what's coming up and so Peter being the classic Peter that he is all right he's he's all in right and sometimes his all in is fantastic and sometimes his all in gets him in trouble but Peter's all in and so verse 22 Peter took him aside and 
and began to rebuke him. All right now, you could you could stop right there, and you can bet that whatever happens next uh, is not going to go well. Anytime that you are going to take Jesus aside and rebuke him, it's not going to end well for you. Uh, but that's Peter. He's he's so all in, and he's behind Jesus completely. Now he says, no, like we're not going to let this happen to you because Peter's ready to die for Jesus. Like when we come and, you know, when they go into the garden and Jesus is praying and on their way out and they meet Judas coming out of the garden, Judas has uh, these Roman officials and they, he has temple officers with him. Right? And so this entourage with Judas meets Jesus and the apostles. And when that interaction starts, it's Peter who draws a sword and actually cuts off somebody's ear. All right, it's, it's a declaration of we're fighting till the end. And I am, you know, Peter's thinking, I am ready to start this battle right here on this soil. To actually draw your sword was almost a declaration of war. To strike Malchus and cut off his ear. You know, fortunately, Jesus is there to, to stop it all. But that could have turned into a bloodbath right there. And I think that all of that shows that Peter's, he's all in. He's ready to die with Jesus. And for Jesus to say that he's going to be executed, Peter says, no, that's that's not the plan. That's not how this is work going to work. <laughs> it's almost like an over my dead body type of thing. All right? But notice... Verse 23, the Lord turned to Peter, or he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. All right, now this is, this is a reflection of Peter's perspective. He's thinking from man's perspective. He's thinking of physical kingdom. And Jesus, I, he, he really lays into Peter because I think, and, and you might disagree with me, but I, we'll talk about it for a second. I think this is somewhat of a temptation to Jesus. I, why would this be a stumbling block to Jesus? Why would Satan in Matthew chapter 4 tempt Jesus with all the kingdoms of the world? Like, why would Jesus in the garden... Pray that if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. I think Peter throws a temptation at Jesus' feet, maybe unknowingly. He says, no, you're not going to die. I won't let it happen. And Jesus doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to take on the cross. He doesn't want to have to endure the physical agony. But I think more importantly, he doesn't want to have to deal with the spiritual agony of being separated from the Father and taking on the sins of humanity. He doesn't want that. Like he wants it. That's why he came. But he's not looking forward to that at all. And so Peter throws this temptation almost in front of him. Jesus calls it a stumbling block. And he says, get behind me. Like you cannot ask me those things. You cannot put that opportunity in front of me. This is what I've come to do. I've come to go to the cross. Jesus had this, this singular focus. He had to to go on the cross. And man, just think about the resolve that Jesus has to have to look at somebody who he loves, Peter, and has just declared this truth about him and then to put him right in his place because he's standing in the way of Jesus' mission. Brethren, I think we struggle on this same path right here. Like we know like, oh, this is God's will for me. But there's people in our lives, there's Peters, at least in this instance, there's Peters in our lives who are throwing stumbling blocks in our path. And they're saying, man, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to be so serious about your faith. You don't have to do that all the time. You don't always have to be righteous. You don't always have to be careful about the things that you say. Why can't you just blend in a little bit with us? Like, it's okay if we go out and we drink a little bit and we go out and we curse a little bit and we go and we tell these jokes and we hang with the world and we blend in with the world. It's okay. Why do you have to be so serious? Why do you have to have such a resolve to follow Christ? Like, I think there's this, this temptation that even comes from our fellow disciples. 
from brethren throwing stumbling blocks in our path. What would have been a, tr a fantastic scenario is for Jesus to say, I'm going to have to die, be buried and raised again. And for Peter to say, Jesus, I don't understand that, but I'm with you all the way. Like whatever you need, I'm with you. And if it means that you have to die and that's the right scenario, then I'm going to support you in that. Like, Wouldn't that have been fantastic? But Peter has his sights set on man's will. And he says, no, we're going to do it man's way. And brethren, I think we get, we get pulled into that. We, we get on this kind of spiritual train that's going really well. And, and we're cutting some things out of our lives. And, and, and we're making good, pure decisions. And, and we're letting the righteousness of God just start you know, blossoming within us. And then sometimes it's Christians that step in and say, well, why are you acting like this? Why, why are you so intent on on praying all the time why do you why do we always have to pray before every meal like even at restaurants that seems kind of obnoxious and people are looking at us and why is it that that we can't watch these movies when you're around and why is it that like sometimes it's christians that throw these stumbling blocks in us because they want so much to see life from the world's perspective and sometimes brethren we're the people throwing those stumbling blocks in front of others and shame on us like, dare we be the people that are focused on the flesh. When others are, are flourishing in the spirit, we should be rejoicing with them and learning from them and growing with them instead of trying to bring them down. And so Jesus rebukes Peter <laughs> because Peter had tried to rebuke Jesus. And then verse 24, uh, going down, there's this, this interesting kind of, the phrase of, of taking up your cross and following me uh, that we've kind of reduced the idea of taking up our cross to some type of uh, daily burden or struggle that we face and we have to deal with uh, when when Jesus is actually talking about the cross right so he's just been declared the son of God by Peter he's just let them know that he's going to have to die and then he says just now you can kind of see the context and the seriousness of it in verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, if you want to follow me, you need to take up your cross. You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And we've kind of talked about, you know, bearing our cross in, in pretty medial ways. Uh, and and not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to disrespect anyone's you know, struggles or things that are going on in their lives. But sometimes we say, you know, like, yeah, I have this, uh, this, this chronic illness and it's, it's the cross that I have to bear. And I, I don't, I'm not trying to make light of any chronic, chronic illnesses or things that people have to suffer with. Like, I, I, I hurt for those folks and I'm glad that, uh, and I feel blessed that I don't have to deal with that, but I, I pray for them. But I don't, I don't want to reduce the cross to that either. And, and things that we have to bear in this life are our struggles and, and they try our faith and they build our faith and, and those things are happening. But what Jesus is talking about is dying. Like you need to be ready to die with me. If Jesus can look at the cross and say, that's where I'm heading. I have to die for this kingdom to be established. And Peter says, no, no, you don't have to die. Jesus says, absolutely, that's my path. And if you want to follow me, you need to be ready to take that same path. Look at verse 25. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. And then he talks about, like, what would you give for your soul? That's the most important. And it might just be that you lose your life in order to serve Christ in a physical way. But I guarantee it, you will lose your life in a spiritual way if you have any desire of following God. That's the part of denying self. Letting go of my personal desires, my personal ambitions, my fleshly lusts. Letting all of that die to serve Christ. He's getting into true discipleship dying to self and letting God reign in you. That's bearing the cross, dying to self 
what would you give in exchange for your soul? What is your soul really worth? Maybe the harder question is not this future question. Maybe it's a past question. What have you given or present? What are we giving in exchange for our soul? What compromises are we making every day in our faith because we want this extra money, we want this extra attention, we want credit for this, we want to feel good, and so we do this. What are we sacrificing in exchange for our soul? It's a hard question. The question ultimately lands here in Jesus talking about the end. When God comes and and the judgment comes, what could possibly be worth your soul? What thing that you've done, what, what happiness that some fleshly desire brought you, what fulfillment of, of money or possessions or fame, like, what can that compare with your soul at the end of time when all of this goes up in a big fire? It won't mean anything. When the angels come in verse 27, what will your soul be worth then? Everything. Absolutely everything. And on that day, there's nothing that you would not gladly toss aside in order to keep your soul. Are we making that same decision today, though? Or are we constantly compromising? Jesus ends this section talking about the kingdom, uh, and it's kind of an interesting, interesting timeline or facts towards the timeline of the kingdom uh, for you know hundreds, thousands of years. The kingdom has been something that people have been waiting for, especially from the time of Daniel. Uh, people that we started getting a lot of information about the timeline for the kingdom, and and Daniel sets out this this series of four kings uh, and and puts. Uh, the, the kingdom coming during the reign of the fourth king, which is the Roman kingdom. And so people have this idea that the kingdom is, is on its way. It's close. And Jesus says in verse 28 that there's some people who are listening to him who will not taste death until they see the kingdom. Like the kingdom is real close at this point. And so don't think that the kingdom is something that is far off. That's going to happen when Jesus returns. No, the kingdom is, is already here. Those people, 2,000 years ago, some of those people saw the kingdom come. The kingdom is here, and it's, it's the reign and the rule of God that is being expressed in the church. Like, here we are, a part of this kingdom that Jesus has built. So, chapter 16 is kind of this roller coaster uh, of, of dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes, and then, and then having to deal with the, uh, the apostles uh, and, and worried about bread. And then there's kind of this high point of Jesus, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. But then Peter tries to rebuke him and there's these hard teachings. And so we're kind of up and down in chapter 16. Uh, but Jesus is not afraid to get real serious and get us really thinking about our personal relationship with God and what we're willing to sacrifice for it and what is really important to us. And that's chap Matthew chapter 16. We'll jump into chapter 17 next time, looking at the transfiguration, uh, which is kind of this, this powerful moment uh, that moves Jesus from his ministry uh, more into getting ready and prepared for the cross. Uh, so we'll tackle that next week. Uh, let's have a prayer before uh, we close out. Father, I pray that you'd help us to really reflect on kind of the things that we let get in the way of serving you. And it's easy, it seems, to let the world uh, kind of tell us what's important. Uh, it's easy for us to let our minds tell us what's important. And I pray that we would instead let your spirit tell us what's important. That we would hang uh, our very soul on the, the idea that Jesus is the Christ son of the living God and that his death, burial, and resurrection was actually a, a, an amazing blessing that we hang our soul on. 
that God, we could never do it without you, without that sacrifice. So I pray that you'd help us to look at our own lives and, and the things that, that we place in front of you and help us to just clear all that out and just pursue you. And no matter what other stumbling blocks people put in our way, I pray that we just are able to ignore those and then move right past those and in turn pursue you and you alone. Strengthen us, God. Remove all fear and let your joy fill us. We pray that in Jesus' name.